Thursday afternoon live. And uh, we're here in the Iowa Great Lakes, and it's a beautiful day out there. The docks are coming out. The boat lifts are coming out. Um, people are getting ready for the winter, and that'll be right around the corner. All you people, I'm sure, out there are getting ready for hunting season, trying to get some hunting in before you get busy with your businesses. And uh, that's, that's coming up pretty fast also. Um, if you're with us, uh, um, not last week, I think our camera crew was out of town. Um, but uh, the week before, we had um, finished the caribou project, and, and uh, that's over here, kind of behind me. And uh, I think you can see part of it. The camera crew's out of the building again. Um, anyway, uh, so we have that, that done. We have several more animals to do, and we'll try to work those in um, in the coming weeks. And uh, this week, we're going to show you a little bit about Createx. Um, we've had several, I think, uh, of our Thursday afternoon lives featuring Crea the Createx, Createx products. And uh, we started with Createx, I would say, maybe two and a half, three years ago, and have just uh, grown to love it over the, over the three years. But it wasn't an instant thing, and we had to have a lot of help and coaching. And uh, now that we've had some time to work with it, uh, we have purged all lacquer products from our shop. Uh, no more fumes and, and uh, no more lacquer, breathing lacquer and hard to clean up lacquer. So we've been using uh, um, acrylics and um, love them and get vibrant colors. And so we want to share that with all of you. Uh, we had guests from Australia last week and to uh, work with a little molding. And, and learn some techniques with us. And we uh, chose a halibut tail to do. So we took a um, fresh halibut tail, fresh frozen, I guess, and uh, looked kind of like this. And it was, has been in the freezer. And we soaked it in water and we made a mold. And we made a, a simple, um, Auto body putty mold. This is this is the mold. And if any of you have um, not not uh, made molds for either fiberglass fish or a beaver tail or you know whatever kind of project that you would you know like to recreate, um, give it a try. It's it's not as hard. There's plenty of uh, tutorials out there on how to do things and. We took uh, the actual halibut tail and we l immersed it halfway in premium bedding fiber. Premium bedding fiber is a, it's a powder you mix with water and it's <clears throat> much like mache, ex exceptional product. And uh, with a trowel, um, this is our premium bedding fiber and comes powdered to you. You get it in a box powdered and you just mix water with it and you know, knead it with your hands till you get a really nice creamy mix. You can see from the bag, it's probably like a, a really soft clay. And more water will make it softer, um, let it dry out a little bit, it'll get a little firmer. Um, premium bedding fiber is what we would use to uh, bed any fish fins, um, fish bodies, um, like I said, beaver tails, fish heads, it's a, it's a great product. You don't have to get new bedding fiber all the time. You just take the bedding fiber when you're done with that project, put it in a bag. We either store it in the refrigerator or you can freeze it. We've got several bags like this down in the freezer in case we have a, a bigger project. Um, this one I just took out, took out of the refrigerator and it's, it's ready to go. Put a little bit of bactericide in it when you refrigerate it or freeze it and uh, it stays nice and fresh. If it should dry out on you, we used to keep it in a five gallon um, pail and let it dry out completely. Then we just fill it with hot water the night before, let it soak, the hot water soak up into the dried premium fiber or premium bedding fiber. It'll dry out just like mache. It'll be really, really hard. Put hot water in it and it'll turn right back to this. You'll have to knead it a little bit, but it's good to go again. Um, never have to throw this stuff away. It's good indefinitely. Once you uh, lay out your, you know, an area for the, our, this was the size of our tail, 
once you lay out a bed that you're going to bed that in, we just take a trowel like this, little, uh, I think it's called a pallet knife, smooth it out. We took the halibut tail, stuck it halfway down in. I usually will trace around it with a tool like this, and then I will excavate underneath where, I, where it gets thicker up in here. At the back of the tail, it's not necessary because it tapers out like any fin to a real, real thin edge. Um, after you've got it sunk halfway into the bedding material, little palette knife and just smooth your edges as smooth as you can get them. The smoother it is, the easier the whole two halves are going to come apart. So it is important. Take your time um, and spend a lot of time making that really, really nice and smooth. Dip your palette knife in a little bit of water and keep smoothing. Then, um, once it's ready, we usually put mold keys. If you look at our mold here, we have um, indentations which are going to index into the other half of the mold. And these, uh, you can use eyes, old eyes that you probably have around the shop. We have a, a mold where we make mold keys because we use so many mold keys, is what these are called. And uh, we just stuck those randomly around the perimeter. When we poured the first half, we removed the mold keys. So the second half, one, one has a female indentation, one has a male indentation, and, and you can separate the two. And they will index right back to the same spot. So you will want mold keys. It makes alignment much easier. Then we mixed up uh, um, auto body putty and added a little bit of polyester resin so it was pourable. Um, poured it over the entire tail and let it set up. Auto body putty by itself will give you the mold that you need, but we usually like to reinforce it with polyester resin and fiberglass on the back. So on this side, you can see we have, it's only one coat, one coat of fiberglass over our auto body putty pour. And this makes a really nice, strong mold that's going to last you know, years and years and years. With a mold like this, um, and we make a lot of fiberglass fish this way too, with a mold like this, you are probably, could probably make maybe 30 to 40 or more positives before this would start to show wear. Once this was hardened and we had our fiberglass on, we flipped the whole project, removed all the bedding material from the perimeter. Once we removed the bedding material, I took it over to the sink and I washed it out as clean as I could get it, dried it. I put a soap um, separator, like I just took some Dawn soap, put it on the edge, and I rubbed a little Dawn soap right on this shelf because you don't want to get your halibut tail stuck between one, the two sides. So I put a little Dawn soap on. You can wax it. There's a lot of different ways to um, separate them. Then we repeated the process that we did on the, this half on the other part. And then you're going to have something that looks like this. I have trimmed the edges so um, it looked a little rattier than this when it was done. Once it's completed, you're going to take, we took sharpened popsicle sticks, we sharpened them like a little putty knife, stick them in here and tap them with a tack hammer until this pulls apart. Ends up looking something like that um, with the halibut tail on the inside. If you make too strong of a mixture, if you're, uh, you put too much hardener in, it will actually cook your halibut tail. So you want to keep the um, auto body putty, the catalyst, down to a minimum to, to set up. Otherwise, it'll make a mess of your halibut tail, <clears throat> which we're not going to use anyway. Um, that's our mold. From that, we waxed and buffed this. We put a PVA separator, polyvinyl alcohol, and then we poured, we, I guess we painted um, super uh, polycasting 
plastic. And uh, on one side, we painted it, painted the other side, put the two together, poured some in here, a couple cups in here, and rotated it around. Um, to make sure that it was, uh, didn't leak out, we put little screw holes so everything aligned. We put a layer of caulk, a thin layer of caulk, so it didn't leak. Put the two together, put the screws in, and when you're ready, pour it in here and just turn it until um, the super casting plastic is set up. Everybody makes it's a urethane, two-part urethane. Um, Smooth On has it, Ramp has it, um, we have it. There's a lot of different companies that carry a two-part. Ours was white, and um, we poured it in, take it apart, and we have a helmet tail that's, that's white. You can add color to it if you wanted to color it. Um, we like starting with a white one, so that's the color we chose. Uh, LD D'Amico, this is the airbrush uh, presentation. Uh, we will be answering the questions that you guys sent in here shortly. So I get carried tuned. away on a tangent. <laughs> I was trying to explain what we're going to paint. Um, we're going to paint a little bit on the, uh, on the helmet tail today, but, and I want to tell you about Cretex. Like I said, we started with Cretex, you know, three years ago, and when you've used lacquer um, your entire career, um, acrylics are different to use. Um, uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve to them that we had to work through. Um, to be able to use them like our lacquers. And now, um, after coming up with our own little techniques and tips that we will pass on to you, um, we love them. They're just a super product to work with. Um, to start with, I think um, I'm going to mix some uh, a color for you just to show you and tell you the different differences. With Createx, you have two kinds of two versions. One version is the Wicked Colors, and the Wicked Colors are very, very thick. When you open these up and squeeze them out, the first thing I did was call the company and I said, um, this stuff's too thick. I mean, I can't spray it. And I was promptly told that it will spray. I mean, it's like pudding. Um, it does spray. Uh, wicked Colors can be thinned. Um, Probably you could put this in a gallon of uh, reducer and it's still going to spray. Um, this is black, jet black, it's still going to spray for you. Um, it won't cover as good the more reducer you put in. The other kind is illustration colors and this is more geared towards the artists and to use straight out of the bottle. You will take this straight out of the bottle, put it into your airbrush and paint with it. My um, method of painting, painting fish, I like to use a lot of transparent colors. Any of the paints out of the bottles, even though they say they're a transparent version, they're a little too um, opaque many times for me. Um, largemouth bass, I want the markings to come through. I want the scale values to come through. And if I use a solid, solid um, olive green, um, it covers up everything. I want something a little bit transparent so I can see the different values of the scales. So to do that, you can add reducer. It's not called thinner, it's called reducer. And there's several different kinds, all for different reasons. Um, 4011 is probably what we use exclusively in our shop. Um, there's a 4020 that has an acetone base. There's one, I think a 4013 that's um, complies with California um, Proposition 65 regulations. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, different humidity um, things will, uh, will affect the paint. So there's different reducers for that also. For, um, 4D11 works exceptional for us and that's what we grab every time. <clears throat> so to, if I was going to take uh, some Wicked Colors, I shake it up. These do settle out, um, just like your lacquer paints. They probably settle out a little, a little harder in the bottom, so you do have to shake them very, very well. Um, we have um, a little vortex shaker. 
Um, we have these on all our desks that we can just shake up our paint and it doesn't take near as much you know, shaking back and forth. If I were mixing, if I were mix, mixing enough to do a lot of fish, several fish, I would probably um, take a bottle like this and I would put my paint in that and I'd add my reducer to what I think is, is the amount that I, you know, am going to go with. Um, with the illustration colors, they say never more than 10% reducer or you ruin the integrity of the paint. 10% with illustration colors. With wicked colors, you can add any amount of reducer that you want, and it's going to spray good. The only thing, the more reducer you put in, the less, less dense it's going to cover. So if we were going to paint a, a large batch of fish, we want to have all our paints that we're going to use already reduced so we don't have to do it um, on the spot, we would take a bottle like that. We'd put in, say, for instance, a um, teaspoon of black and as much reducer as we think that we want, if we're using Wicked, <clears throat> to get the coverage that we want. And it'll take a little bit of playing. You learn, it's going to be real confusing when you start, and you're going to um, learn rapidly what works the best for you. If we're just going to do a small amount, we would take it, put it in a little, I think these are little pill cups. And remember, Wicked color, I can put as much reducer in that I want. Now, one more secret that took us a while to learn was, although I think I have it mixed up really good now, you will have the best painting experience if you let this set for 10 minutes before you use it. And I think the term is it has to emulsify. And once it's sat for 10 minutes, um, this will paint very, very nice and, and creamy-like. We struggled for quite a while before we figured that out. And Craig Kennedy was kind enough to answer all our phones, all our questions on the phone. And we. Uh, called quite a bit because we were, we were struggling. Um, if you try painting with this right now, um, you're not going to be impressed with Createx paint. Let it sit and go on getting your fish ready, um, getting your you know, eye protect on or whatever you happen to be working on, and uh, let that sit. When you're ready to paint, it's going to be ready for you. OK, now one of my issues with Createx when we first started is I couldn't get a, a really nice transparent or I, I didn't find the transparency that I really wanted um, in the colors. They're, they were too solid. Createx has a whole array of different um, clears and sealers and things like that and we found that by adding a clear which looks about like Elmer's glue. It's very thick um, and, and harsh, dense color, but it, when it dries, it's clear. Um, by adding clear to um, either one of your illustration colors or your Wicked colors, you just diluted the intensity of the color by however much of this you put on. You can make it very, very transparent or, or harsher, more, more coverage if you'd like. To do that, We'll make some red. There is a marble in these things, a little shot. And if uh, when it breaks loose, you'll hear it shooting from side to side of the bottle. Okay, now I have red. Now I can put 
um, reducer in here. Now remember, with Wicked, I can put as much reducer in as I, as I want, so I could make it quite transparent. Um, I'm going to add clear. And I could add up to probably 100%, and it's still going to look red, but as the uh, gloss clears, um, it's going to make a really transparent, soft, soft hue. Now, this is kind of a thick paint right out of the bottle. Remember, the, the Wicked color is thick out of the bottle. It goes a long way. It's a little bit better value um, for your dollar because you can thin it so much. Now, if this were in a bottle, I'd shake it up. Um, I would just want to mark that I that this is a transparent version so that you don't think you're going to paint fish gills and, and turn them solid red. When it dries and that um, gloss turns clear, you're not going to have a very intense red like you might want. So that's all it is, there is to it. Um, I would set these aside 10 minutes. This one's probably been 10 minutes, ready to go. Um, there's just little little tricks to working with uh, acrylic colors that we didn't know when we first started, which makes a big difference when you start. Yes? Uh, Stewie Jones says, I love your lives. They have literally changed my life. Thank you. And then we For the better? Well, I'm hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, Jacob would like to know if you can use oil-based paints or is water-based paints better for taxidermy? I, I used oil when I first started taxidermy and we used to take oil out of the tube. We would mix it in a plastic container like a, a milk jug with mineral spirits. We had to put a dryer in it because oil paints do not dry fast, and we were able to spray it through an airbrush. They sprayed very good. We always had to strain it before we used it. Um, it worked good. Oil base dries extremely slow. Um, so if you look at any of the fish I did <coughs> 40 years ago, they were black on the back because you couldn't paint the back because you couldn't touch the back. You couldn't touch the front. You couldn't turn them around and hold them. <coughs> With um, modern day paints like lacquers would be a better choice, I think, than oils. Um, and going back to oils, there's a lot of people that paint oils like this. And a real artist can probably paint a fish better than any airbrush artist using oils in a brush like Picasso. Um, <clears throat> typically for commercial work, you know, you want to spray and speed up the process. Um, Lacquer paints would be my choice before, I think, oil paints. Um, acrylics are like lacquers. Used to be the old acrylics. Um, any of the old water-based paints took a long time to dry. So not like oils. Oils took days. Um, water-based paint probably took um, 10 to 20 minutes. So you would paint the side of a belly of a fish white, you couldn't touch that for 20 minutes. So you'd paint the white, set him aside, go to another fish, paint the white, then you come back to that. Um, you will see when we paint with any of the Createx, it dries as fast as lacquer. It's a 15 second dry time, unless you get it on really, really thick. It dries fast. Um, nothing wrong with oils, and the minute I tell you don't use oils, you're going to show me the best fish ever painted with oils, but it's, it's a different process and there aren't a lot of people that I know of that use oils. Okay, now with any of these, um, how I've mixed any of these, and, and you, when you start out you're going to be way confused. You're going to say, oh my gosh, what did he say about this? How much reducer do I put in? Was it 4011, 4010, 4020? You know, they're going to be all mixed up. Um, start with it, you will, you will learn really, really fast and get comfortable. 
but you'll be unsure for a little bit. And um, call the tech line. We answer questions all day long. And if you have any uh, Createx questions, give us a call. Um, we like this stuff so much. It's really exciting to talk to people on the phone because things that they're doing when they start, we did also. And uh, it's easy to tell them you know, how to make it work really good for you. OK, for an airbrush. I have set up a harder Steenbeck. And I think um, the Createx paints will paint out of any airbrush that you select. Um, we painted everything in our shop for years and years and years with a $50 H airbrush, and it painted exceptionally well. Now, I was using this this afternoon, so Anytime I um, quit using an airbrush, it works best to clean it. Don't, uh, don't let your paint dry out. Even though this is water and you think it dries a lot slower, it's rapid drying. So if I had paint in here, two hours, it's probably going to be like Elmer's glue down at the bottom. That is another um, thing. If I had to say something bad about water-based paints is the integrity of water-based paints is much stronger than, say, lacquers. Lacquer paints, um, if I paint a fish, I can literally scrape it off with my fingernail. It's, it doesn't adhere near as good as water paints. Water paints stick. Um, and the longer they sit on, the longer they, um, the harder they get. So you do want to clean your airbrush. You will need to keep it cleaner when using waters than with um, um, lacquers. Lacquers, we used to take an airbrush like this, um, let it dry up solid as a rock in there. And a month later, we could put a little bit of thinner, back bubble it a little bit, and it's good to go again. Um, if you do that with uh, waters, you're probably going to have to take it all apart, dismantle it, um, and clean it extra good. OK, and just to see what we've done here, I've got some black. Anytime, if you have it in bottles, we found, um, we found that by mixing it like this, like we used to do with our lacquers, we would pre-mix our, we always thinned our lacquers quite a bit. Um, we would thin them in the plastic bottle, use them, set them aside, next time we painted, fish or finished deer or whatever we were doing, we would take um, the same bottle, shake it up, and it's good to go. We were a little apprehensive to do that with waters because it does settle out in the bottom. You'll see the pigment down here, and you'll see a clear, the clear reducer up here. All you got to do is shake it by hand or use your little vortex shaker. And you can get these things. Um, I think Amazon has them there. It does speed up your mixing of your paint. Now, whenever I start painting, I like to have, and this was thanks to YouTube, um, there are, if you want to see and be impressed by Createx artists, um, Look at some of the YouTube videos of people that are doing um, painting little figurines and things like that. They're not taxidermists um, mostly, but they're airbrush artists. And uh, the people that are using Createx will just boggle your mind at the talent of some of these people and the precision that they're getting out of this kind of paint um, is kind of what directed us to this product in the first place. But in one of these videos, um, you know, we were always taking things apart and cleaning them up and trying to clean the bowl real good. And um, in watching and visiting with some of these people, um, several of them just, this is just warm water. The reason it's warm water is I don't want to stick my hand in cold water. And once you're done painting, spray out your paint, stick it down in, in a little bucket of water, and blow it out. Shoot a bunch of water through, and you're good to go. 
Now, I just saved myself probably 75 cents worth of reducer because I didn't waste a bunch of reducer trying to clean my airbrush. I just squirted it out with water. And since it's an acrylic paint, water is a great cleaner. So I mixed this before we came on the air. And play with your, um, play with your PSI. Um, it doesn't have to be um, 50 PSI or 35 PSI. We have little regulators down here on our quick disconnects um, that we can adjust it. And when you adjust it here, you really don't know um, where you're at exactly. You have to go by what works for you. And the, uh, the nice thing about the harder Steenbeck is it has a little governor. If you push that closed and turn it clockwise, my needle is shut and I can't, no paint will come out. By turning it a little bit, most of the airbrushes have this. The, the Iwata has the same little governor. Any of you that have used those, same type of little regulator on the back. I'm going to open it till I can get a spray. Now you can probably see I'm getting nearly a pencil line, a fine pencil line. Now one thing you'll need to pay attention to with, with um, acrylic paints is they dry so fast that you will get a little tail on the end of your needle and it's called tip dry and when that little bit of paint is on the end it will not paint. By taking your thumb and scraping the end of that needle which sticks out there I'm good to paint again. To clean on the harder Steenbeck to clean it you can pull this all the way back and that allows your needle to Come back and make a, let all the paint flush out. If your airbrush stops painting on you right in the middle of detail, um, go ahead and flood it out like this on a towel or little piece of paper towel and start again. Because it's, because it dries fast, it can dry in your tip. Dennis would like to know if they make a cross reference for watercolors to lacquer paints. No. Well, I shouldn't say that, no. Um, they do um, hide, um, Lifetone used to have a really good one between Polytranspar and life tone. I guess those are both lacquers. Um, no, and not that I know of. We may we may do that for somebody sometime. Uh, you know, black is black. Uh, there's a couple different kinds of whites. You almost have to go by the color and the color swatches to start with. Okay, so you can see how how nice this paints. I mean, that's, I couldn't get that better with anything, and it's, it's uh, all water. Now, um, look at this. I get paint all over my hand. Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? You're going to just wipe it off like that, and it's gone. Unlike lacquer, which gets under your fingernails and all that kind of stuff. Okay, to start with, I'll show you what I've done here on the halibut tail. I kind of started started on the back thinking I'm going to paint the other part of it for you and uh, then I thought that's going to be hard to match because I've got all different paint and stuff. Um, but this is this is kind of what he looked like on the back side and it's not very pretty, it's very camouflaged and very mottled. 
it's hard to do wrong. Um, so here's what I've done so far, this top part, and I'm going to show you how I did that. But uh, um, I'm just going to take on, I do this on a lot of reproduction fish. I'm going to take a darker color. In this instance, it's going to be black. I'm not going to make him black, but I'm going to shade this whole area with a darker color, and then we're going to steel wool it off, which is going to highlight. You can see down here where it highlighted all my kind of texture in between the fin rays. So we'll do that. It's a good way to, for me, oftentimes, to um, start a reproduction. Try to do it up so you can see. Now as I'm putting this on, just to show you how fast this dries, I can touch it now. And I don't have any paint on my hands is how fast this water base dries. If you got any questions, just text them in and I'll answer them while I'm working here. We do have one from Christian. I'm new to taxidermy and have started with fish. I really like Cretex colors, but I can't seem to find any schedules for fit. Well, I guess you kind of just answered that one. So, um, would you have any other suggestions going forward until there would be an option for that? The best option is when I first started doing fish and knew, knew not what color went anywhere, um, and I've got this fish lane in front of me, not knowing what to do, um, I had some instruction and they said, I had these patterns from another, of, of oil paint is what we used to use in those days. And uh, it didn't matter if you were using oil paint or if you're using um, waters or lacquers, but you always started with blending, blending the damaged areas. So you rebuilt the top of the head for the eye, you know, or top of the head that shrinks in. You build, rebuild the bottom jaw, you, um, uh, set the eye in probably a fix-it sculpt or an epoxy sculpt and probably re-fixed any damaged areas that you had and rebuilt his vent in any shrunken areas or holes or hook things or stringer marks. So you, f you repair all those. That's the first thing you're going to do. And we always did that with a, a color that matches the skin. So if your skin is, is dark, like say it's a small mouth and it's kind of a, a platinum-y color, kind of a browny gray color, um, softly, softly cover your epoxy areas. So that's the first step. Second thing on any of my schedules, always said, and it didn't matter what paint you're using, um, white, and it would say one-third or one-fourth away up the side. And when we taught the North Coast Iowa School of Taxidermy, we had all kinds of colored patterns, and they were all the, they kind of all started out the same. You take the white up to where you can see it on the fish skin, um, just softly and fade it out as you go up the side. And so with all of our patterns, even though it was a different kind of fish, if you followed the same lightness and darkness and blendings and things like that, that kind of got you into the ballpark, and then um, 
you do something like this, you know, get a good picture of what you're trying to copy and um, match that. Okay, now um, on a reproduction, this is what I would have done whether it was a largemouth bass or a walleye or whatever. Now I'm going to take steel wool and I'm going to steel wool this black, which I hope is going to stick down in the details and the recesses and I won't be able to get it out, which is good because it's going to outline all those scales and textures. Now, if you were doing a walleye, for instance, and you painted his skin dark like this, and you steel wool it off, the whole side of those, all those scales are going to be outlined in, in dark. Uh, we have a question from Keith. Um, a guy bought a new Badger detail airbrush from us. Can you show us how to get the fine detail line or spots like on a trout? Um, that's, that's easier than you think. To get, didn't say what kind of paint he's using, um, but it, it's kind of the same for any of them. Um, we always get the finest detail by turning down the air pressure and making sure that your um, paint is nice and thin. If you thin your paint too much and your air pressure is too high, it's spider legs and it goes all over the place. So if you thin your paint to do detail and turn your air pressure way down, um, you can hold your airbrush really, really close without getting spider legs. Um, so thin it and turn the air pressure down. I would say we were talking the other day to somebody and, and they were asking about air pressure and I'd say, Brett and I both said, we sometimes paint at, and it depends on the thickness of your paint, we sometimes paint at seven, five to seven PSI, which is very, very, very low. And if it doesn't paint, your paint is too thin for that air pressure. Okay, now my, when you paint something like this, you don't paint part of it and then stop and then come back and do it again because matching this to this is probably going to be hard. I'm going to end up repainting, I'm thinking. Okay, but now you can see this, with this steel wool, I have uh, put a whole lot of kind of cool detail in it. All the, all the straight rays, I have steel wool down to white. Um, all the little texture between, the little scale texture, um, show really nice. Now, I have no, no recipe for painting this. I'm doing nothing but um, kind of going by this picture. And though he's been dead and in the freezer a while, um, I think if I can come up with a nice mottled color, um, I've been fortunate enough to catch hell of it and have an idea in my head of what I want to do. But um, if, I can, if I can match a kind of a mottled color, um, he's got some yellows in him, he's got some browns in him, different kind of pretty to me, maybe not pretty to everybody, but it's kind of pretty coloration. Okay, I'm going to take, I mixed this up earlier. LV D'Amico would like to know if we provide a waterfowl kit of paint to cover some of the more common species and colors. Um, not yet, but we will. I think we're going to have to start with this fall. We're going to have a mammal finishing color set. Um, 
and we have talked about, uh, you've seen the little grid thing, like you pick out your species and you follow it across, and it'll show you which color for that, for a, a bluebill or for a mallard or for a largemouth bass, whatever it happens to be. In the future, Okay, now this is kind of a light olive type color. There is such a wide range of airbrushes to choose from. What do you recommend for a solid starter airbrush? I think you should have one of each. Not really. <laughs> Kate, you look so serious. Um, well, you are a pro. There are so many airbrushes. If, if I was really, really, really watching my pennies and still wanted a, an airbrush that would do the job, you just can't beat the Pache H airbrush for I think they're still in the $50 range. They're extremely inexpensive. Um, we've been to, I mean, we go to shows constantly, and, you know, when it's show season, and we always end up visiting with the competitors and stuff like that, and there will be somebody with, um, I mean, the Wasco Award and, the, you know, all the different, high-end awards and inevitably the conversation always comes down to what airbrush do you use because if you want to be like that person you got to have an airbrush like that correct um, and they'll say oh I just use a Pache H that's a $50 airbrush you're a world champion and you use a $50 airbrush you know um, I thought I was going to use a if I got a $600 airbrush maybe I'd be a world champion you know but um, um, it's not so much airbrush as how well you use it. And the, uh, I can't say enough about, about the little Pache H, and it comes with even a siphon bottle or a little cup on top. Um, very, very good for beginners. We still have, um, when we were um, teaching people, we had 16 of them set up here. One for, we could paint four people and they all had eight colors. Um, so that worked really exceptionally well. How about for a mid-end airbrush? How about what? For like a mid-range price um, Mid-range, you got to do probably almost $300 for, I think, I think the Badger, Badgers have some um, reasonable airbrushes that aren't, overly expensive. I know Pache does too. Um, I guess I would jump up. I would like to jump up to the Hardestein Beck for maybe, what are they, 280 or something like that. Um, Iwata's can't be beat and they're, um, um, oh, I don't know, $300. Brett uses a Hansa and you could not pry this from his fingers and it is 160 or 70 dollars. Um, it's an interesting airbrush because try and do everything with one hand. Um, it says it's a single action, and the single action is a little bit like those compressors that the minute you push down the trigger they start. Um, this, the minute you push down the trigger, you pull it back and the paint starts. Um, it's a single action kind of, but it's different than any single action. Um, he loves that. As a matter of fact, we had somebody today call, and they were asking about airbrushes. Didn't want to spend $300. I said, if they got the Hansa at $160, $70, whatever it is, and don't like it, I'll buy it from them because I have always wanted one. <laughs> um, okay, accidentally, I got really lucky on that, that color, and... It matched really good. Are you 
you're going to apply a top coat, either gloss or matte, to your work, and why or why not? I would eventually do a gloss. Most of our fish, um, I have had customers come in and say, I don't want one of those shiny fish. You know, they look fake. Um, I think a shiny fish looks wet. You know, so I like, I like shiny fish. Um, just a personal preference. I've seen some exceptional fish that aren't shiny, that have a nice satin or matte finish. Um, I will gloss this. It's going to be on a nice, real nice base. Got to not touch it with wet hands. Now this is the, that was my match accidentally. I didn't think it was going to match that good. I think it matched pretty good. Um, but I will use a gloss on that, any of our commercial fish, unless we're asked not to, which we are sometimes. If we're asked not to, um, we'll give them any kind of finish that they want. Um, and four finishes, somebody's going to ask, four finishes, um, as we're painting fish, a lot of times we will seal our work because sometimes we're using um, pan pastels. We combine, um, we might paint a little bit with a, with an airbrush and then come in with a pan pastel and we'll paint a little bit of fleshy on them. Um, this will wipe right off. So we seal that with a workable fixative. We have not found anything yet that um, Createx is not compatible with as far as, as far as sprays. We use workable fixative a lot. We have, um, Matte finish. Now the matte finish also will seal your um, powders on, your metallics. Now if it were a, oh say a, a trout of some sort and we are using the Perlex powders, we might paint with an airbrush a little bit when it gets time to finish or when a, a little metallic base, we'll come in with Perlex powders or maybe the pan pastels. Those have to be sealed. We seal those with the workable fixative not the mat. The mat is a little too thick and builds up and it kind of gets a cakey look. It makes your, um, it puts too thick of a finish on as does the satins and the clears. So if you just want to set your powders so they don't wipe off, um, workable fixative, like so. These are all Krylon products. You can get them in your local hardware store. Um, Satins, semi-glosses, clear glazes. Um, we'll paint a, a deer nose and um, on it we'll use uh, uh, maybe a semi-gloss or a gloss. One of the best things that really looks nice is once you paint around your deer eye the, the hairless skin, um, set it with a satin and a satin adds luster without, adds life to it. Not shine, but it adds life to it rather than dry it out. So satin works really good around your facial features. Make sure you put some kind of frisket on. Okay, um, now the only thing I did on this side that I haven't done yet on this side is come in with a darker color and shade around here. I did put a little bit of, I don't know if you can see, I have flesh here, and the flesh that I would use would be that one that I mixed up and I put very, very little um, paint in it compared to the, I made it really transparent with the gloss, and I can do that. Um, the harder Steenbeck um, airbrushes also have a version that's a bottle if you wanted to put your paints in bottles. I need this need these on an easel for you. Now if your airbrush ever quits Go ahead and take it off the side and open it up with a wet tip. Clean off your little fuzz on the end.
So that's this side. Now, if you ever wanted to, and you made a fiberglass fish the way I described to begin with at the beginning of the show, um, you can um, make one for yourself. You can make several of these. At one point, we did a lot of state record catfish for Iowa, and one of the biologists came in, and he wanted, they brought in the state record channel catfish, and to have a reproduction made, and they wanted one for all of their hatcheries, so we had to do five of them, you know, the same fish. So. Okay, on the back, the back of this fish is all mottled. It's white, a lot of flesh on it. So I'm going to uh, play with that a little bit. Are we running out of time? Okay, now I washed that out in water, so I still have water through the tube, so I'm just spraying the water out. Now, before I started, I took a little lead pencil and tried to sketch on where the white met the model part. So you can't see it because it's too light, but on here I have little pencil marks that are going to disappear when I paint on them, but it kind of gives me a little guideline of where to go. So when we get done, we'll try to post a picture of what this is going to look like. It's going to be in a, I'm going to, first I'm going to just recreate all that modeling in here. Um, he's got a whole lot of little black speckles or dark speckles, um, a lot of flesh, a lot of looks like Payne's gray, Payne's gray out in here. And I'm going to just copy what I see, um, the person that said for a paint schedule, um, you're going to look at a good picture of what you want to copy and identify colors. Um, on the body of a largemouth, you might have a dark, dark olive on the back. You might have a brighter green on the side. You might have a yellow behind that and white. So your body colors need to, I always said, they fold into one another, not, uh, not stripe. So make sure that your body colors all fold into one another. Um, and then take each fin individually and look at it like this for coloration, where the darks are, where the lights are, where the yellows are, greens. Um, once you start looking at the real fish, it'll be way easier for you to come up in your head with a real um, color schedule. And um, if you wanted to call us, we can walk you through it too and get you started. We do that all the time. Um, and Caitlin, what are you giving away today? giving away a six-pack set of Createx paints. 
I believe they are our little sample kit of our primary illustration colors. And the winner of that goes to Sarah DeJournet, and Sarah won. Sarah? Yes, by liking and sharing our previous um, video. So if you want to be entered into next week's giveaway, make sure to like and share this video. Uh, if your account is set to friends only, you will need to um, go in and edit that post to public so we are able to get you entered in. This has a 4011 reducer in it. It's got five colors. Um, give it a try. Any of you that want to try Createx, now if you want to switch to from lacquers to water base, you could easily spend three to four hundred dollars if you get everything that you think you're going to need. Um, I suggest, you've never done this before, you don't know if you're going to like it, you might hate the stuff. Um, I suggest get a color, any color, red, black, brown, green. Um, if you want something for fish, uh, raw umber detail is an exceptional olive color. Um, get a bottle of this, get a smaller bottle of 4011, and play with it. I think you're going to grow to love it. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful product. Good? Good. Thanks for joining us. No ice cream truck today. He's gone for the season. Winter is going to be approaching us, but we're going to enjoy fall before that happens. Thanks, everybody.